Greetings to you, my brothers and sisters in Christ. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. I bring you greetings here from Friendship Baptist Church, where our pastor, Dr. Reginald E. Backus, and our Sunday School Superintendent, Sister Frederick Williams, all of the officers and members of this church, we're just so blessed that you are joining us for our Sunday School Hour. This is the Sunday School lesson for May 22nd, 2022, and the title of the lesson is Free to Love, taken from the book of Galatians, the fifth chapter, verses 1 through 15. Our key verse for this lesson is Galatians 5, 14, and in the New King James Version it reads, For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. We have a really great lesson today. I think it's going to be a really uh, big help to us. and It's going to be a great encouragement for us as well. We have three goals in this lesson. First, we will examine the differences between legalism and the freedom that comes with the responsibility. Second, uh, we will understand that freedom comes from trust in Christ alone. And then third, finally, we will commit to serving and loving, loving others as a result of the freedom that we have through a relationship with Jesus Christ. So again, a really good lesson. I appreciate your presence. I appreciate your support, and we definitely appreciate your prayers. Uh, if by chance you have stumbled upon this lesson for the first time, uh, make sure that you turn on your notifications and that you subscribe to the channel. We share content weekly, our evening Bible class each Wednesday at 6 p.m., our live worship service each Sunday morning at 11, and of course, our Sunday school uh, general lesson overview. Uh, so we'll begin with prayer and jump right into the lesson. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for another opportunity to study your word. Father, we thank you that in the midst of uh, difficult circumstances, you continue to bless us, you continue to protect us, and you continue to provide for us. Now, Father, as we break into your bread of life, as we look into your word, we ask that you give us understanding, that you give us wisdom, that you strengthen our faith so that we might be better equipped to do the work that you have called us to do. Thank you for this church. Thank you for our pastor. Thank you for each person that is sharing with us today. And let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. It is in your son, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, so for the second consecutive week, and we'll be in Galatians again next week, but for the second consecutive week, we find ourselves in the book of Galatians. Uh, for this lesson, we should remember that Paul wrote this epistle uh, uh, and, and sent it to the church in Galatia, which is located in the western part of what is now present-day Turkey. And the church probably consisted of a Celtic group of people that were eager to grow in Christ, but they really had no understanding of Jewish and Old Testament law and the history of Judaism. After first being introduced to the gospel and giving their lives to Christ, missionaries from all over the region began to spread out and share the good news of Jesus Christ. One of, this, one of these groups of missionaries uh, were Jewish Christians who were preaching with great fire but unfortunately, they were preaching a misguided gospel. Their message was not rooted in faith in Christ alone, but rather they preached a blended message that pointed towards Christ while still requiring strict adherence to the Old Testament law, which required circumcision. Now, to go even further, they also questioned the authority of Paul in hopes of convincing the church in Galatia to ignore Paul's contradictory message, uh, even though Paul was preaching the true gospel. In today's lesson, we again see Paul addressing this misunderstanding of salvation uh, and how it is attained, and we stumble upon the term of legalism. So first, we need to define what legalism is. It's the belief that behavior and actions work towards the goal of salvation. It puts works above faith, and it kind of is summarized by your working to earn your salvation. Now, all Christians must ask the simple question, if we are able to earn salvation through our own works, then what is the purpose of Jesus Christ and why did he have to die for our sins? The simple question reveals its own answer. We simply can't save ourselves. Last week's lesson focused on the temporary effects of the Old, Test Old Testament sacrificial system and how through Jesus' work on the cross and his subsequent resurrection, we now have permanent access to salvation. This salvation is given by God to those that have faith in Christ, and that's the only way we can get it. It's the only way to be freed from the penalty of sin and to spend all of eternity with God. That's a faith in Jesus Christ. In today's lesson, we must all understand that there is no compromise to the word of God. All believers, regardless of how uncomfortable, must accept the full word of God 
with that, without adding to it or without taking anything away from it. Uh, as the church grapples with ways to remain effective and, and, strategy, and strategies to reach younger generations, we are tempted to water down or dilute or ignore aspects of God's word that contradicts the ways of the world and what is considered culturally acceptable. But the church in Galatia, they struggled with letting go of older traditions and they have now been convinced uh, uh, that those traditions were necessary in the work of their salvation. 2000 years later, we struggle with the acceptance of lifestyles and practices that the world directly uh, conforms to. Either way, whether it's holding on to the past or trying to figure out ways to become, reach this new generation, we must realize that nothing but faith in Christ leads to salvation. And that faith is directly rooted in God's word with no wiggle room to make adjustments based on our own preferences or our own comfortability. And so I really believe this lesson is going to be a blessing to us and we'll jump right in. Again, we'll be in Galatians chapter 5 verses 1 through 15 and all of our, all, all of our scripture will come from the New King James Version. The first portion of our lesson is standing firm in freedom, uh, taken from Galatians chapter 5 verse 1. The text reads, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. So after presenting his case to the church in Galatia, Paul uses chapter five to make his final appeal to move forward in their faith and the belief uh, that they have liberty through Jesus Christ. Paul first acknowledges that the freedom that Christians gain through a relationship through Jesus Christ is given by Christ through his work on the cross and resurrection. This is not something that we earn, and we really play no role in achieving this freedom. Rather, the moment that we confess our belief in Jesus Christ and repent of our sins, Christ freely gives us the gift of salvation, and with it we earn freedom, uh, freedom from the law and freedom from sin. For the Jew, it frees them from the bondage of the law, and for the Gentile, it frees us from the bondage of sin. Paul simply asked the church in Galatia, why would you accept the gift of salvation and the freedom that comes with it from Christ only to return to the same bondage that that freedom has just rescued you from. Paul refers to our new position as a result of this freedom as a position of liberty, not the liberty to do what we want, but rather the liberty to be free from the necessity to earn our own salvation. As we covered last week, the purpose of the law is to reveal sins in our lives and drive us towards Christ not in, a, in an attempt uh, to take the easy way out, but in the acknowledgement that once we realize the depth of our sin uh, in our lives, the depth of sin in our lives, we throw our hands up surrendering to God and accept that, that, that the debt that is owed is too much for us to pay on our own. It's a humbling notion, but it's one that rings true for each and every one of us, regardless of how good our lives might appear to be or how good we think that they are. Christ's work not only pays the price for our sins, but it gives us the liberty to live a debt-free life and no longer be responsible for the work necessary to grant eternal life. To further make his point, Paul addresses the yoke of bondage. This concept was widely shared by Jewish Christians connecting our relationship with the law to that of a yoked animal. However, the Jews were not able to earn salvation from God within the law so how could they now insist that this Gentile church return to a dependence on the law? The yoke of the law was all about restriction, living uh, according to the hundreds of commandments and hope that you could keep them all, which was an, an impossible task, even for the most righteous of us. The gospel of Jesus Christ is not about restriction, but rather it signifies freedom. That's freedom from death, freedom of eternal life, and freedom from the bondage of the law. So we see standing firm in freedom in Galatians chapter five, verse one, but now we see the law demands total commitment. In Galatians chapter five, verses two through six, the text reads, indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. You have become estranged from Christ, you who attempt to be justified by law, you who have fallen from grace. For we through the spirit eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything, but faith working through love. So in the second verse, Paul actually names the issue that is the root of the conflict between him and the conflicting message of the Jewish leaders. 
The book of Galatians, most likely Paul's first epistle, was written uh, close to 50 AD. Ten years later, Paul wrote the book of Philippians. In the third chapter, Paul goes on somewhat of a rant in the book of Philippians, meant to establish his authority and identify the legacy of his heritage. Uh, Paul explains to the church in Philippi who he is. He says that if anyone puts their confidence in the flesh, no one should have more reason to do so than him. He says if uh, he was circumcised the eighth day, the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, a Pharisee, and he had the zeal uh, to work for the church to the point that he persecuted those that opposed uh, what the church stood for. All of those things mean a lot to the people of the time, from Paul's previous position as a Pharisee to him being a member of the tribe of Benjamin, which was the only tribe that never worshiped idol gods. Yet Paul, when he first begins his rant, the first thing that he lists is his circumcision. In Genesis chapter 17, when God made his covenant with Abraham, God commands that all their descendants should be circumcised the eighth day of their birth, and if not, they will be forever cut off from God uh, and cut off from their people. Uh, this was such a strong practice that they even uh, performed the ritual, the tradition on the Sabbath, which was normally a day that they would not be able to work and definitely could not interact with any type of blood. But however, God allowed that to take place because the act of circumcision really was somewhat of the foundation of the covenant uh, between God and Abraham and the children of Israel. The act of circumcision, it continues to be a foundation of the faith within Judaism. And there are instances in the Bible in which non-circumcised Jews uh, from the wilderness are immediately circumcised once they uh, kind of get back with their people. Even Jewish Christians converts looked at the practice of circumcision uh, as being a symbol of relationship with God and a cultural norm. And so for some, the practice of circumcision was more important than the necessity of baptism even in the life of Christians. Paul specifically tells the church in Galatia that the act of circumcision will accomplish nothing in the life of the believer. Specifically, Paul says that if you go forward with the act in an attempt to grow closer to God, we effectively dismiss and deny the complete work of Christ that's been done in our lives. What purpose would we need to get closer to God through a tradition rooted in the law if our relationship with Christ already gives us full access to God and eternal salvation? To say that there is more that is needed is to say that Christ has not done enough. And we know that Jesus paid it all. Paul then explains that the spiritual act of circumcision brings us under the law and ideally rejects Jesus Christ and his power over our lives. This denial of Christ and desire for the law removes us from the grace of God and returns us to the place that we were before the coming of Jesus Christ. This is where the term legalism reveals itself in the text. Paul questions why would the church in Galatia want to give up their freedom and return to the bondage of the law when the law has proven to be ineffective in achieving what they already have received from Jesus Christ. That's freedom, that's salvation, and that's eternal life. In verse 6, Paul again identifies the source of righteousness in the life of the believer through faith and faith alone. That's how we achieve righteousness. That's how we achieve salvation in our lives, through faith and faith alone. To eagerly await means that we not only know that it is coming, but it also shows that it is given from a source that we have no control over. Again, Paul highlights the truth that our faith produces righteousness. It's a process and it always begins with faith. Our faith draws us nearer to God. As we get closer to God, we begin to read his word and speak to him more. That in turn allows us to hear from God and understand his will for our lives in a clearer and more precise way. That in turn produces works through our surrendering to God's will. And the result is an increase in righteousness in the life of the believer. But again, that entire process starts with faith. If we have faith, that faith draws us to God. And as we get closer to God, we start to understand his will. We start to hear from God and it produces righteous works. In other words, spend time with God and get to know him and watch how time spent will translate into better living and turning away from sinful living in the life of believers. All of this is given by God in response to our faith in him. Paul reminds again that the act of circumcision will do nothing for our relationship with God. Jesus said it himself, I am the door, and no man comes to the Father but through me. In what 
can be considered a slight dig at the Jewish Christian leaders, Paul says that if you're circumcised or not, it avails nothing. Or better put, it gets you nowhere with God being circumcised. This directly contradicts the growing belief that the Jewish Christian Christians were uh, better than Gentile Christians because they were circumcised and followers of this important Old Testament commandment. So we see standing firm in freedom. We just covered the law demands total commitment, but now we look at stern words for troublemakers. Galatians chapter five, verses seven through 12, the text reads, you ran well, who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion does not come from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in you and the Lord that you will have no other mind, but he who troubles you shall bear his judgment, whoever he is. And I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why do I still suffer persecution? Then the offense of the cross has ceased. I could wish that those who trouble you would even cut themselves off. So in, ver in verse seven, Paul directly questions the church in Galatia, asking them, how did they get so far off course? He first points out that they were initially on the right track. This confirms the excitement and wonderful work of the Holy Spirit in the early days of the church. There was a strong commitment to receiving and adhering to the word of God. And Paul considered the church in Galatia to be a wonderful example of God's work amongst the Gentiles. But somehow between their first introduction to the gospel and now Paul recognizes that someone must have convinced them to grasp a hold of something false and contrary to what was first introduced. Again, the issue of legalism is lifted and Paul wonders how did the church turn away from the grace of God being the source of their salvation and now shift their attention to their own works. Paul refers to this misinformation that has been accepted as a hindrance, which prevents the church in Galatia from continuing down the path of salvation that they were already on, a journey that they were earlier successful in, but now have gotten off track in. He literally states, I don't know where you all went wrong. I thought that you had, had it figured out. Paul then shows them just how easy it is for a small amount of misinf misinformation to distort the entire truth. Just a week ago on cable news, uh, uh, one of the pundits said that the Supreme Court justice and their families had to be uh, shipped off to secret locations by Secret Service uh, because they were in danger from rioters uh, protesting the, uh, the leaked draft of the of the uh, decision that will overturn Roe v. Wade. The statement was completely false, but within hours of him saying it, politicians were all over the media spreading the lie. When directly questioned about his source, the man responded that he read it on Twitter somewhere. Thankfully, the entire thing was a lie, but it shows how easily lies can spread. All it takes is a little bit. Again, to understand the context of this issue, we must look at the church in Galatia with our first century imaginations. There was no internet or fact checking resources available at the time. There were no printed records of the work or words of Christ and the epistle and, and the epistle in Galatia was one of the first books written in the New Testament. Their entire relationship with the church was based on preacher sermons that they had heard and subsequent missionary teachings. Paul and his team were most likely the first to introduce the gospel, but there were so many other false teachers, including people claiming to be the second coming of Jesus Christ. In what can be considered the wild west of the early Christian church, it is not uncommon for young and immature Christians to become confused amid so many contradictory teachings. At least from the, that context, we can somewhat understand how issues of theology and disputes uh, arose in the early church. But when we, we would be remiss not to look at the 21st century church in a time in which we have so much access to so many free resources, we have so, no excuse to be uneducated or immature in our faith. When we can study, learn, and dive into the word without any limit, there is no reason for us to ever fall victim to false prophets and false teachings. Paul makes it clear that all it takes is a little misinformation and it can ruin our entire understanding. And that is exactly what happened surrounding the discussion on the necessity of circumcision. So after Paul lays out his argument, he then encourages the church in Galatia. He tells them that he is confident that the church will hear his words and recognize the truth of the gospel. Paul, again, just as before, credits the understanding to that of the Lord and not that of the Gentiles. It's the Lord that will clear this up for them if they stay faithful and seek out the truth. At Moody, we used to always say that it must be faith-seeking understanding 
and never understanding seeking faith. The same faith that drove these converts towards Christ is the same faith that would allow the Holy Spirit to move within them and discern the truth in these conflicting messages. Paul not only encourages, but gives credit in advance to the Lord, recognizing the source of the clarity that he is sure will one day come to this Galatian church. Paul seems to send another shot at those that are the source of this misinformation. Whoever he is, he will bear judgment. It's a reminder to all believers that even though those that oppose God may seem to get away with their sinful ways, one day the justice of God will catch up with them and they will be judged accordingly. Paul then again doubles down on the irrelevance of circumcision in the life of the believer. Paul says that he no longer preaches circumcision because if he did, it would take away the power and the accomplishment of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And then in verse 12, we see Paul's frustrations boil over as he simply concludes that I wish the people that are telling you these lies would just simply go away. Realizing through his own words the damage that Jewish Christian leaders are doing to the body of Christ with their false doctrine focused on the necessity of the law, Paul said, I wish they would just leave you all alone. So we saw standing firm in freedom. We saw how the law demands total commitment, and we just covered stern words for the troublemakers. But we conclude this lesson with the way of love, and that's found in Galatians chapter 5, verses 13 through 15. The text reads, again from the New King James Version, for you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Not only, excuse me, for you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be, lest you be consumed by one another. So Paul concludes by reminding the Galatian church of the freedom that they have uh, that they've received through the work of Jesus Christ. Christianity is not about restriction or boundaries. It's 100% about making the right choice in the midst of many options. When it comes to the laws of the land, I as a citizen don't think that we should force restrictions on people. Even now the church is being forced to take a position on abortion as the nation grapples with the upcoming Supreme Court decision. As a Christian, I know exactly what the word of God says, but I also know the moment that we begin to restrict freedoms, there will be nothing to stop those restrictions from infiltrating the way that we worship and the way that we share and practice our faith. Our country was founded on freedom. So as Christians, our job is to present the gospel to all. So when life gives us the opportunities to make a choice, to make a decision, those choices and decisions are influenced by the word of God and not, as what, not what is comfortable, what is popular, or even allowed by the law. Paul shares with the church in Galatia that the freedom that we have are granted through faith in Christ is not a freedom to do whatever we want, but rather it's a freedom to make the right choice in the midst of many options. Finally, Paul puts the source of our actions. Uh, he tells us that the source of our actions, uh, wh what the foundation of our decision making should be. Referencing the law and the Jewish Christians' insistence on upholding certain aspects of the law, Paul claims that the entire law can be summarized in one word. By one word, he means one phrase. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Regardless of how isolated we might think our actions are, all of our actions have consequences that affect the lives of people around us. We may not always see them, and, we may, and they may be small ripple effects, but each choice we make affects other people. With sin, the effects are long reaching and they reverberate throughout the, our lives and the lives of people around us, impacting our relationships and affecting our ability to be of use in the work that God has given us. Paul says that if we allow this principle to love others as we love ourselves, to permeate each decision that we make, then there will be no need for the law because the purpose of the law will be fulfilled in the way that we live our lives and the way that we treat other people. Paul says that if we fail to show love towards others and allow, if we fail to allow love to dictate our living, then we will be no different than wild animals attacking and devouring one another to the detriment of us all. So this is the end of our lesson, a really strong lesson, and I'm really encouraged by the words here. It was not a long lesson at all, but it's meant to help us to focus that we should not be fighting with one another. Uh, we should not be easily deceived by the word of God. First of all, 
we are fallible, meaning that we get things wrong. And so whenever we're approaching the word of God, whether it's from a student perspective, whether it's from a teaching perspective, whether it's listening to a sermon, whether it's preparing Bible class or just hearing someone share the gospel, we need to make sure that we engage with the Holy Spirit and seek uh, discernment so that the Holy Spirit will reveal to us what is right and what is wrong. Uh, I, I tend to take the watermelon approach, uh, meaning most watermelons have seeds in them. And when you eat watermelon just because it has seeds, sometimes you get a piece that has a lot of seeds in it. That doesn't mean that it's a bad piece of watermelon. It just means that you have to digest it and spit the seeds out. And so unfortunately, sometimes we're presented with messages or we're presented with the gospel in a way that we see some things or we hear some things that we know is not right or that might even be contrary to the word of God. And in those moments, it doesn't mean that we just ignore everything. It doesn't mean that we just uh, give up or throw in the towel, but we need to engage with the Holy Spirit and seek the discernment of the Spirit so that we can digest the good parts and throw out the bad parts. And that's what everything, whether it's a sermon, like I said, a song, or just someone sharing their faith. Uh, we need to rely on the Holy Spirit to direct us and to making sure we're hearing the right things, that we're uh, uh, receiving the right things, and that we're allowing those things to dictate our living. Uh, everyone makes mistakes. The best preacher, the best teacher will make a mistake, but it's the Holy Spirit that we de depend on and rely on. And that's really what Paul was telling the church in Galatia. He was saying that, I don't know how you got so far off track, but I'm encouraged because I know that the Lord will get you to the right place. And so our prayer, our goal as Christians should not only be to do the will of God, but that God allows his spirit to direct us and guide us, that we're not taking in things that we should not take in and that we rely on the Holy Spirit to do that work for us. Again, not a great, not a long lesson, but a really important lesson. I, I pray that you have been helped and encouraged with this word. I know that it helped and encouraged me. Uh, I think sometimes I tend to lend on my own. I tend to lean on my own understanding too much. I think I tend to lean on my own education and experience too much. Uh, but this lesson has reminded me that it's the work of the Holy Spirit, the work of the Lord that controls what we receive and what we don't receive. And so I need to make sure that my prayers are starting to direct uh, my faith towards a full dependence on the Holy Spirit and nothing else when it comes to discerning what I should and should not do, what I should and should not listen to, what I should and should not receive. So I thank you for your presence. I thank you for your prayers. I thank you for your support as always. If you want to support the work that we're doing, here at Friendship Baptist Church, we do have four ways for you to give. You can give through our website, fbcchicago.org. You can text the word give to 773-992-1462 and follow the uh, prompts on your phone. You can uh, mail your check or money order to the church, Friendship Baptist Church, care of Dr. Reginald E. Backus, 5200 West Jackson Boulevard, Chicago, Illinois, 60644. Or you can use cash app, dollar sign, Friendship Chicago, and you can support the work that we're doing here. Uh, if by chance you're looking for a church home, we would love to have you be a part of the work and partner with us. Uh, we have a wonderful body of believers here. and We're just on fire for Christ. We're doing some amazing things here in the Austin Lawndale community on the west side of Chicago. So if you're looking for a church home, we would love to have you be a part of our family. Or if you're not in this area or you're looking for someplace else, just let us know. And we'll be happy to help you uh, find a place where you'll be comfortable worshiping at. Make sure that you're supporting the other uh, worship opportunities that we have here each Tuesday morning at 8 a.m. We have a prayer call led by our senior associate, Reverend Aaron Davidson. The phone number and the access code is on your screen. Uh, we call out each name of our sick and shut-in list, and we ask for God's will to be done and uh, throughout all of creation. Each uh, Sunday morning, 9.30 is our Sunday school, 11 a.m. is our worship service, and Wednesday at 6 p.m., is our evening Bible class, and all those things can be found on our Facebook and YouTube pages, Friendship Baptist Church, Chicago. I thank you for again for your presence and prayers, and uh, please make sure that you join us again if the Lord says so, and we'll see you next week, same time, uh, same channel. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. 
We thank you for all that's been said and all that's been done. Father, continue to let your will be done in our lives. Give us discernment. Help us to lean on your Holy Spirit so that we can understand what we should be doing according to the, your purpose for our lives and so that we know what to take in and what we should not take in. Uh, Father, in the midst of so many conflicting messages, help us to uh, stay on the straight and narrow path. Help us to stay focused on your word and your will for our lives, and we'll be sure to give you the glory in all that we do. We thank you for our pastor, Dr. Backus. We thank you for our Sunday school superintendent, Sister Frederick Williams, each Sunday school student and teacher throughout all of creation. Just bless us and keep us according to your word. It is in your son, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, on behalf of our pastor, on behalf of our superintendent, Dr. Backus and Sister Williams, we just praise God for you. We pray that you have a wonderful week and that God continue to bless you. Uh, go in peace and serve the Lord. Amen.